There is a wonderful love novel by the French surrealist Louis Aragon, and it starts with this wonderful phrase. The first time he saw her, he found her frankly ugly. And that was my reaction to the theory of objective countertransference when I first heard it. I objected to it on so many levels, I can't tell you. I was um, very influenced at that point by existentialism and taking responsibility for oneself. I thought the idea that one person could cause another person's feelings was just utterly appalling. So this is not something that was intuitively uh, appealing to me on any level. But once I saw how it actually worked in clinical practice, both the elegance of the formulation and also the immediacy with which it seemed to yield some kind of results, um, I, I really did fall in love with it and I've stayed in love with it. So I know that there are many people who find this theory uh, frankly ugly. So what I'd like to do is try to give it its best possible or at least the best possible presentation that I can give it so that you can at least consider it on its own terms. Um, and basically the idea of uh, objective countertransference starts with the idea of emotional communication. And emotional communication, the way I define it, is that one person expresses a feeling and another person responds by having a feeling. Simple enough. And the feeling that the second person, the receiver, has bears a logical and causal relationship to the first person's feeling. Now, in and of itself, I don't think that that sounds particularly revolutionary. It's very similar to language. I express something in language, and you hear the words. We have a consensually agreed upon set of meanings, and some communication takes place. In language, when one person says something and somebody else hears something, we wouldn't say that they necessarily have perfect comprehension of each other, because each person's association to the words are going to be different. There are some languages where we would say that there's almost perfect um, uh, communication taking place. For instance, mathematics or computer languages. What it means is exactly what it means to the person who's perceiving it or understanding it. But once we get into spoken language, it's more complicated. So when I talk about emotional communication, I view it as one of two kinds of communications that human beings engage in at all times at almost every moment in their lives, except in the very earliest periods of infancy before language. And emotional communication is the form of communication that predates language, both evolutionarily and developmentally. Okay. Animals communicate through emotional communication. You know, the lion roars and something gets frightened or runs away or responds in some way, or another lion roars back, or the hyena attacks the lion. But whatever it is, they're causing feelings in each other. They're expressing feelings to usually communicate something about their intentions or about their emotional state. And other animals respond, all without language. And this obviously happens with our dogs and cats, and occasionally even with birds, all the time. And it's also the kind of communication that takes place before infants have language because, of course, infants don't speak language. They cry. They, in the language that I'm going to use, induce feelings in the parent, in the mother, and that's really how parents have some idea of what's going on in the infant's mind, what the infant's needs are. The infant cries, and you get the sense that they need to be nurtured, or they're hungry, or they need to be changed, or they need to be rocked, and it's often very difficult for human parents to know exactly what they're infants need, unlike animals who seem to have a much better job of it than humans do. But humans have another form of communication, which is cognitive communication, which is basically language. But language contains both types of communication. It contains both the meanings, the strict meanings of the words, the strict meanings of the grammar, but it also contains, especially when we're talking, the intonation, the prosody, the tone, and everything that goes with that. So when you're talking, two things are going on. There is the communication of the meaning, and there is the communication of the feeling. And the feeling is what I'm calling emotional communication. So what then is objective countertransference? Okay. Emotional communication is going to take place all the time, every time we talk, every time we don't talk, every time we relate from one person to another. 
It doesn't mean that every feeling that we have about somebody else is a communication from them, because we have our own feelings, we have our own memories, we have our own motivations, we have our own reactions. But one set of reactions that we have to other people are going to be those feelings that they are inducing in us. And this is a part of everyday life. Okay? And the important thing, by the way, about psychoanalysis is that it works because it's a subset. It is a way of looking at something that happens in everyday life. All of these concepts that we use in psychoanalysis, transference, counter-transference, resistance, defense, all of these things, these aren't things that happen just in psychoanalysis. We use them in psychoanalysis. We focus on them in psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis and the psychoanalytic relationship is a laboratory for really, really examining them, but they're everyday phenomena. All we're doing is we're looking at absolute everydayness, but under a very particular setting. Okay. So, emotional communication is going on at all times, and we're constantly reacting to people. Okay. Some of this emotional communication is purely here and now. Okay? Something is going on in the present, we're expressing our pleasure or our displeasure with it, we're expressing our interest, we're expressing our motivation. Okay. But some of it gets linked to repetitive patterns that, we, that get developed early in life. Okay? And we are all familiar with those, I hope, and fear. Okay? <laughs> Which is to say that we engage in characteristic ways of relating to people, in characteristic ways of responding to people, that are grounded in more or less helpful, constructive, pleasurable, or displeasurable, traumatic, miserable ways of relating that, were rela that are connected to our early life experiences. One of the key ways that we relate to people is through emotional communication that's linked to early repetitions. And when you have early repetitions, there's constant tendency to relate to other people in ways that are directly linked to your original environment, both for better and for worse. But we don't usually worry about the better ones. We usually worry about the painful ones. We, through emotional communication, we don't just experience other people as being similar to situations that we had in early life we can actively recreate those circumstances. So in other words, through emotional communication, through inducing feelings in other people, we can manage to make them have the feelings that people had in your early everyday life. So for instance, and this is a very common one, if you lived in fear and people were often angry at you, and people often screamed at you, an experience that unfortunately many, many people have, you can unconsciously and involuntarily relate to other people so that they have a tendency to get angry at you. You actually recreate the original environment. Right? Now, what is going on in a situation like that? On the one hand, the other person that you're dealing with who is getting angry at you has their own life history, has their own propensity to get angry, and has all kinds of reasons why they might get angry. On the other hand, you also have your life history, and you end up stimulating in them the propensity for them to get angry at you. So if you approach them with fear, you aren't necessarily distorting a situation, you are actively recreating a situation. These are repetitions. Repetitions happen to everybody at all times, and they are really the heart of what we're dealing with in psychoanalysis. We're constantly working with repetitions that people have that are unconscious, that are involuntary, and that are connected both to their behavior and to their patterns of emotional communication. Okay. Clear so far? Any questions or anything like that? Okay. So, what are we trying to do in psychoanalysis. We are trying deliberately, unlike the rest of somebody's life, to create an environment in which those early patterns of emotional communication can be reactivated in the relationship with the analyst. We're doing this deliberately. We want the patient to be able to come in and to induce in us the feelings 
that they induce in other people so that we can understand the parts of the patient's experience, the parts of the patient's memories, the parts of the patient's perceptions that they can't put into words. What they can't put into words, what they can't say, they induce in the analyst. Freud said in one of his most brilliant lines, the patient does not remember, but the patient repeats. And a crucial dimension of the repetition is that they stimulate these feelings in the analyst. Now, this is a, an idea that really contrasts with both the classical perspective on countertransference and with contemporary perspectives on what happens in the uh, analytic relationship. So I want to talk briefly about those. The classical idea was that the analyst would be able to listen to the patient without having any feelings about them. They would observe, they would listen, but they themselves would not become emotionally activated by the, by the patient. And the whole purpose of the training analysis, or at least one of the purposes of the training analysis, was to allow you to reach this point where you would respond to the patient without feeling. Now, if you really look at the classical literature and you really look at Freud, there are nuggets, there are ideas that go against this, okay? It got very oversimplified and it got purified and it got very, very extreme. I was just reading in um, Margaret Mahler's uh, memoirs that when she was training in Vienna in the 30s, they had taken this to the absolute extreme. <coughs> that somehow or another, all feeling on the part of the analyst was considered to be absolutely out of the question and bad. But you don't really get that in Freud, but nevertheless, that was the classical tradition. I think it was well-intentioned. It was a really good idea. It was growing out of a period in time when, when people were really trying to make things scientific, and it seemed like a reasonable thing to do, to approach other human beings in a scientific way where you could bring your feelings out of it. But in the process, at least from my perspective, they left out a whole dimension of human communication. Uh, this, this whole dimension of human communication that goes back to the animals and goes back to the earliest days of infancy and continues throughout life. Okay. This idea also goes against certain kinds of two-person psychology ideas, even though this is clearly a two-person psychology. You need two people in order to allow an induction to take place. But there, the concept these days is usually that both parties will contribute to the interaction between what happens between the patient and the analyst. So the notion is, is that what happens is co-constructed. Each party brings their history. These histories form, uh, what would be, uh, they form a matrix. Both the analyst and the patient put in their, uh, their two bits, so to speak, and what you get is a product of both of them. Now, I would say that that is a very reasonable description of what goes on. However, what it, do, what it leaves out is that there's going to be patterns that each per person brings to the relationship that are going to be less co-constructed, which is to say that some parts of the analytic relationship are going to be dominated primarily by the patient's repetitions. Some parts are going to be dominated primarily by the analyst's repetitions, and some parts are going to be what they really do together that's new. So the purpose of the analysis, at least from my perspective, is to help the patient with their repetitions. It really isn't to form an inventory of what each person brings to the analysis for the purpose of figuring out what's going on between the two of them. The purpose is really to help the patient with their repetitions. And in order to help the patient with the repetitions, it seems to me that the focus of what's going on should be what the patient brings to the analysis, what the patient is making the analyst feel, and how these feelings are consistent with the patient's life history. Which brings us to the question of then, what is objective countertransference? Objective countertransference are those feelings that the patient induces in the analyst, the causes in the analyst that are consistent with the trends of the patient's life history. Okay? So that when you look at the feeling, you ask yourself, how does this make sense in terms of the story of the patient's life? Okay? 
how does what I'm feeling as an analyst fit in with everything else that the patient is telling me? Now, when you do that, you will usually find that it makes sense on some level, as long as you're willing to listen carefully enough and wait long enough. Okay? It may not be immediately apparent, but I think once we actually start using the concept, it's absolutely astonishing how often it's immediately apparent. So what we're looking for are consistencies between the analyst's feelings and the contours in the story of the patient's life, life story. Okay? Now what do we get when we find these consistencies? We do not get an absolute truth. We do not get the truth about what happened to the patient. We do not have an objective fact about the world. What we get is a clinical hypothesis. And the hypothesis is this patient is repeating this experience with the analyst at this point in time. Okay? Once the repetition comes into the analysis, we call it a transference. They are talking about how miserable, same thing, okay? <coughs> I was late, okay? And then I talked to the person wrong. And I just can't tell you, I hate this job. I never wanted to sell flooring. I wanted to be a philosopher. And why am I selling linoleum when I wanted to be a philosopher? And you're having the feeling, that's terrible. They wanted to be a philosopher. They wanted to study Hegel. And instead, they're selling linoleum. <laughs> this fucking economy, I feel so bad for that person. I wish I could create a chair of Hegelian studies for them. I wish they could just sit there and do that. And of course, you may not say that, but you might say that. But you might, say some, you might find yourself wanting to say something like, well, you know, this economy is terrible. You know, it used to be that you could get a job as a philosopher, but you can't anymore. And now you're stuck with all these other jobs. And I, you know, I remember when I was trying to get a job, it was so hard, and you're being nurturing, and you're using very soothing language. So that you're starting to nurture the person. You're starting to meet a maturational need. Whether or not you're doing this, this is what you're feeling. You're feeling empathy for them, but you're also feeling sympathy. It isn't enough to feel empathy. It's that you want to soothe them. At that point, we're looking at it, and the induction is in the anaclytic mode. Okay? You have a different feeling from the patient. Okay? The patient is suffering. You're not feeling their suffering. You're feeling nurturing of them. It's a differentiated mode but you're feeling like giving them a maturational need that is equivalent to the kind of thing that a parent might do. Okay? And again, we're not talking about technique. For the moment, all we're trying to understand is what is the relationship between the analyst's feelings that are being, we're hypothesizing are being induced by the patient and what the patient is experiencing and how they are experiencing the analyst. So, in any given moment, when you are having a feeling, you want to start running down these dimensions. And how are we going to run them down? First of all, what specific feeling am I having? Okay. Is this feeling the same as the patient's, or is it different from the patient's? That answer is not going to be conclusive, but it will already begin to tell you whether or not you're dealing probably with a differentiated relational mode, or narcissistic relational mode. It's going to be telling you in, in plain language, is the patient experiencing you as being the same as or like them? Or is the patient experiencing you as being different? You want to get the intensity, okay? I'm feeling very, very intensely irritated that the patient isn't showing any affect. What, is about, what does that mean? Does that mean I'm experiencing affect that the patient can't experience? Am I experiencing affect that the patient can't express directly? That's going to give you a sense of where the intensity is, how, uh, how strong the defenses may be operating. Okay? Um, and then you're going to want to ask much more clearly about the relational mode. How might the patient be experiencing me? How might I be experiencing the patient? And how is that affecting what's going on between us? And then you're going to want to go, where else in the patient's life are we seeing this? Okay? Where does it fit? Who else feels this way with the patient? Who might have felt this way with the patient? How is this reproducing some dimension of their experience or somebody's experience of them? 
to the extent that we see a similarity between or a consistency between what we're experiencing and some dimension of the patient's life, we're going to suspect that this is an objective countertransference, which is to say a repetition of a pattern of emotional communication that is rooted in the patient's early life. Okay? And then from, the, from a more current descriptive context, we are going to say our experience is congruent with something that the patient is saying, doing, feeling, or acting. Okay? We are looking for areas of congruence. To the extent that we have congruence, to that extent we have some degree of, um, I don't want to call it certainty, the probability that what we're experiencing is a genuine part of the patient's life. If everything was congruent, <laughs> life would be really simple. Okay. However, and unfortunately, that's not the case. Okay. Some of, with sort of with the more, with the more flamboyant patients, with the more flamboyant pathologies, and you know what? I want to just say how I'm using the term pathology because it is so loaded these days. Okay. From my point of view, pathology, psychopathology, is going to be whatever internal obstacle the patient has to getting what they want out of their life. Okay? I will occasionally, when I'm thinking more in terms like a psychiatrist or when I'm just feeling like a son of a bitch and I'm not really being a clinician and I'm just giving vent to my spleen, might want to use pathology or diagnostic categories as a weapon, okay? But that's not how it's supposed to be used. That's an abuse of the concept of pathology and psychoanalysis. The real use is, from my point of view, pathology and psychopathology are the internal obstacles to, that prevent somebody from getting the, the life that they want, okay? From that point of view, they choose what they want, and if they can't get it, it's either Reality doesn't give it to them, and that we can't do a whole lot about, but we can help them remove their internal obstacles. So with some of the more flamboyant pathologies, we can see all kinds of congruences right away. But with a lot of people, we will have strong, intense feelings that may persist, that may be hard to figure out, that have no immediate relationship to what the patient is saying or to what the patient is doing. So on some level, this whole concept, uh, and I'm going to call those incongruent inductions. Okay? These are, incon are countertransference feelings that are incongruent with what the patient seems to be doing or what the patient seems to be saying. So on the one hand, one could argue that this is an out-and-out -out trick. Okay? Because I've started by saying that an objective countertransference is consistent with the patient's life story. And in this case, I'm saying, hey, wait. There are countertransferences that don't seem to be consistent with what the patient's life story is. Okay? Now, why do we bother with these when they seem to violate the whole principle of the thing? The reason is I have left out one crucial dimension, and the crucial dimension is time. Okay? At any given point in time, we only know so much about the patient. We only know so much about their life history. We only know so much about their life story. Sometimes we seem to know a whole lot, and sometimes we can work with somebody for years and know next to nothing. Okay? So when you're looking at whether or not something is congruent or incongruent, you always have to take into account the possibility that what seems to be incongruent is in fact congruent, but the information hasn't been revealed yet. This, again, is why I have to emphasize we're dealing with a hypothesis. Some of the problems that people had, I think, with earlier formulations of objective countertransference were that the analyst would somehow or another be assumed to know as an objective fact based on their experience that something was true about the patient. We really never know what's true. All we know is what we think might be a possibility, and we use that to try to formulate an intervention that's going to help them. But we never really know what's true. It's very important whenever you're using this concept to keep the hypothetical nature in mind. Okay. So let's go back to an incongruent induction. 
there's always the possibility when something is incongruent that it is the opposite of objective, and in this model we call the opposite of objective subjective countertransference. Subjective countertransference is that current within the analysis that's related to the patient's, to the analyst's life, the story of the analyst's life, and not to the patient's. It basically gives you no information whatsoever about the patient. It is in accordance with the traditional formulation of countertransference and interference and contributes really nothing to the process. Everybody's got it, but the fact of the matter is, my experience is that if you're listening to the patient, it is a relatively minor piece of the whole experience of the patient. There are areas where subjectivity becomes very, very important, where subjective countertransference becomes an obstacle, and I'll try to get to those tonight, but, I'm not, but I might not. But in terms of just the raw experience of the patient, again, the more you assume that it's going to be subjective, the more you're turning away from the patient. And just all I can tell you is so many more times than not, if you wait long enough, you find out that so much of what you thought was subjective turns out to be consistent with the patient's life history. Now, sometimes it's years, okay? This is a, this is a long-term model, but it can take that long. Incongruent inductions, and we can't, again, we can't know whether they're really inductions until we've got the information, until we've waited a long time Strong defenses. Strong defenses that keep the memories out of consciousness, that keep the defense out of consciousness, that even seem to keep the defense out of behavior. Okay. Let me give you an example. A person was coming in and they were learning how to cook. This is in one of the chapters. Okay. Now, I used to be a chef. Okay, so I'm pretty comfortable cooking, okay? It's, uh, it can be scary at times, but it's not something that terrifies me. Okay? But this person was talking about learning how to cook, and they were taking cooking classes. Now, I used to teach these classes, so they really don't scare me, okay? But, you know, they would talk about cooking and learning how to cook and chop and, and all the rest of it. And, and I'm sitting there, and I'm so scared. I'm just gripped with anxiety, okay? <laughs> Utterly gripped with anxiety. I used to be afraid that I would fall out of my chair. My chair is not easy to fall out of. Okay? It's just, you know, it's not like one of these playground things, you know? It's, just, it's got two arms and everything. You know? It's not going to happen. I felt so uncentered by this for weeks and weeks and weeks. Now, this is, I wouldn't say that it was completely incongruent because it was always related to this person's talking about cooking lessons. So it was clearly linked to something in the material. But, you know, the level of anxiety, they were expressing zero anxiety about this, except for a degree of carefulness. You know, this week, we, we learned how to chop an onion. But, you see, even there, this, this was a uh, non-English speaking person. So their language was a little bit deliberate, and it was a little bit more deliberate. She spoke, she spoke English beautifully, but maybe it was just a little bit more deliberate. That, you know, if you look really carefully, you would find something that betrayed anxiety. But did she ever come in and say, I was so anxious about this I couldn't see straight? Was I, so, I was so anxious about this that I could barely stand up, that I'm falling out of bed at night? Nothing that was obviously congruent with what I was experiencing. Okay? But it was so strong, and it was so disruptive. I mean, it was almost impossible to hear what she was cooking, because I was so worried about falling out of my chair. <laughs> you know? And as the lessons went on, and as she became more comfortable, I was getting much more comfortable. I'm assuming that that's what happened. In that case, I never did find out, nor did I really find out what it was about cooking that may have been so distressing. Now, when you think about cooking, there's all kinds of things going on. You use sharp knives, so there's the potential for aggression, there's the potential for cutting off your fingers, there's the potential for poisoning somebody, you can burn things, there's issues about fat being fed and feeding. I mean, you know, you know, psychoanalysts like us, we can have a field day with something like cooking, but she wasn't talking, okay? <laughs> All she was doing was reporting her experience of cooking lessons in the most emotional neutral language that you can think of. Now sometimes these incongruent inductions are going to be much, much more subtle than that. They may be that you just, the person comes in and they seem perfectly interesting, 
and they seem perfectly engaging, and they're not overtly narcissistic, and they're not overtly depressive, and they're not overtly obsessive compulsive, and they're not overtly whatever other kinds of symptom cluster we might find would be something that we would tune out on, but we find that we just can't pay attention to them. Okay? Just can't focus on them. Okay? Now, what, what does that mean? We really don't know. We don't have the information. It might mean that the parent was unable to focus on them, that the patient was self-absorbed. We always find ourselves going back to thinking about something in ourselves when this patient is trying to engage us. And there's nothing overt about what they're saying that tells you what the meaning of that is. But you never know. You might listen. This may happen for three years, four years, five years, you know? And suddenly they go, you know, I don't always have the feeling that my husband is listening to me. Sometimes I feel like I'm talking to him and he's just not there. Sometimes I feel like my father just tolerates my presence. And then the congruence comes in. Okay? That's why you don't want to focus on yourself. That's why even if you don't have the answer to what is the relationship of my feeling to the patient's life, why you always want to at least provisionally assume as a hypothesis that something is going on in their life that's being repeated in the analysis. But I do want to emphasize that even if you have the idea that your feelings are a product of the patient's interaction with you, that does not entail any particular technique. It doesn't mean that you have to do anything. The one thing that you have to do before you do anything else is try to understand what's going on, and until you understand, sit tight and keep the patient comfortable and talk about whatever it is they want to talk about or do whatever else you're going to do. But once you're, when you're faced with these congruent inductions or incongruent, especially the incongruent ones, you just want to maintain the idea, the open question, the probability that what you're feeling has something to do with them. And I want to emphasize this particularly with the incongruent inductions because these are the ones that are so deeply defended that they really cause the most pervasive problems in the patient's life. They may not burst out in severe pathology. They may not burst out in real obvious relationship problems, but they're often at the root of some of the pain that's sort of the most pervasive and the most chronic that people experience. So, what does the countertransference analysis consist of? It consists of constantly going back and forth between saying to yourself, what do I feel? What are the dimensions of the, what I feel? What is this, the feeling, the specific feeling? What's the intensity? What's the relational mode? Back to what the patient says. Everything that they say, everything that they do, and then hypothesize the relationship between the two using those same dimensions, seeing what you can match up, seeing what doesn't match up, and seeing what seems to click. 